Good morning and welcome to our online service here at Leclerc Christian Church. I want to encourage you, if you haven't yet, to take a moment to fill out that online connect card. You can find a tab nearby to access that. Uh, let us know that you're joining us today. And also, if there is any prayer requests that you have going on or anything that we can be praying for, there's a place to write those down and, and we'll get that sent to our staff and our prayer team. We would love to uh, just be lifting up whatever might be going on in your life today. Also, next week we have our next Discover LeClaire class. If you are fairly new with us, or maybe you've been visiting for a while and have not had a chance to come to this class, I wanna personally invite you to join us. Uh, right now we're doing those via Zoom, and you can sign up on our website, leclaircc.com. Click on the events tab and just look for Discover LeClaire. But this is just a great place to learn a little bit more about the church, and this also gives us a chance to get to know you a little better as well. Uh, we'd love for you to join us, so if you're interested, please, please sign up. Uh, we are continuing in our series called Staff Picks, where different members of our staff are sharing uh, a story from the Bible that has been meaningful or impactful to them. And so today we're continuing that, and uh, our children's minister, Kelsey Cook, will be sharing with you in just a moment. But before, let me pray for us as we begin. God, thank you so much for the chance that we have to worship you and, and, and each week to still uh, gather with our families or gather in our homes to um, just worship and to learn more about you. I pray um, that you would continue to lead and guide in our lives and, and help us as we um, just learn more and more about what it means to have faith in this season of our life. We love you so much, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. We worship with me this morning. Uh, we're going to sing about breakthrough, and we're going to sing a song called Won't Stop Now. So join in with me today. Give you glory for all you've brought me through, and now I'm ready for whatever you want to do. I'm moving forward to follow after you, and now I'm ready. Whatever you want to do Your presence is an open door Why you, Lord, like never before Your presence is an open door Cross before me, I hope on things above, and in you, Jesus, yeah, the best is yet to come. Through this morning, sing, I know. I know breakthrough is coming. 
everyone. My name is Kelsey Cook and I am the kids minister here at LeClaire. I'm supposed to be working with our infant through fifth graders on Sunday mornings uh, when we're not in the middle of a pandemic, but I'm really glad to be with you here this morning worshiping God together. Uh, we are in week two of our staff pick series uh, here on Sunday morning. So during these weeks, you'll get to hear from a different minister about our favorite story in the Bible. And I'm excited to be able to share my pick with you this morning and why it's my favorite story. Um, I have a question for you. How many of you have ever ridden first class on an airplane? So I'm very used to riding on the coach side of the plane. Uh, my parents and my family, they live in Oregon. So ever since I was in college, I'm used to flying back home to visit them for holidays and things. But about six or so years ago, my father-in-law, in an act of kindness, gave us some points to use for airline tickets. And for whatever reason, it ended up using fewer points when we chose first class seats. Don't ask me how that works. I don't really know, but I was really excited. For the entire trip to Oregon, we would be in first class. This is gonna be like a really big treat to me. So I will tell you that I had a two-year-old at the time, and this didn't really phase me. She was gonna have her own big seat in first class. I wasn't gonna have to wrangle her in a tiny, first, or a tiny coach seat for the whole time. So I was thrilled, but let me tell you, when you walk into first class with a two-year-old, People don't really give you the nicest looks. Um, I know they felt like they wanted to enjoy their flight in peace. They'd probably paid extra for their seats and all that. And here I was, the recipient of some free seats with a toddler that could potentially mess up their peace. So I went from being really excited to actually being really uh, uncomfortable, feeling out of place. Most of these first class people, they, uh, they, they felt like it was their, their second home. They were used to traveling in this comfort for vacation or for business. But me, I felt like I didn't belong. Have you ever been there? If we're honest, we've all probably felt this way a time or two. Felt like you were in a place where you didn't belong. 
In our story today, in my favorite story in the Bible, we're going to talk about a guy who found himself because of the kindness of someone else in a situation where he didn't really belong. He found that another's kindness completely changed his story. Because kindness can change someone's story. I know that you guys are all probably pretty familiar with the story of King David. Uh, David was that shepherd boy who was anointed as Israel's second king. He famously killed the giant Goliath with only five stones and a sling. David was also known as being a man after God's own heart. While he wasn't a perfect man, his heart was turned toward God, and for the most part, he sought to live his life for God. Now, the king who ruled right before David was a little bit different. King Saul, Israel's very first king, was not a man after God's heart. In fact, partway through Saul's kingship, the Bible tells us that God rejected Saul as king and chose David to be the next king of Israel. So even though David was the next king of Israel, he didn't actually take the throne right away. David actually served Saul in several different capacities within his household for years before he would take the throne himself. So during that time, David developed a friendship with Saul's son, Jonathan. And this was a friendship for the ages. You guys know about Buzz and Woody, uh, Harry Potter and Ron Weasley, Samwise and Frodo, Chandler and Joey. But I'm here to tell you that David and Jonathan were even closer. The Bible tells us that David loved Jonathan as himself. These guys were best friends. In fact, there came a time when Jonathan chose to protect David, even from his own father, King Saul. David had told Jonathan that Saul was out to get him, but Jonathan didn't want to believe this about his own dad. So the two made a plan to test out David's theory. David would be absent during a special festival meal, and Jonathan would gauge the king's response to David's absence. But it turned out that David was right. King Saul became so enraged that he even threw his spear at his own son, Jonathan, and accused Jonathan of protecting David at the cost of his own right to the throne. So Jonathan had to go out and tell David that David had been right all along and that he'd better get out of town in order to save his life. These guys were close. And before Jonathan and David separated for David to live a life on the run from the king, Jonathan and David made a covenant a pact, an oath, a really strong promise. You see, Jonathan knew that David would be the next king after his father. He knew that God had chosen him. And instead of being jealous that David was going to be king instead of himself, Jonathan protected David and helped him out. And Jonathan and David made this pact, this covenant together. 1 Samuel 20, 14 through 15 says, But show me unfailing kindness like the Lord's kindness as long as I live, so that I may not be killed. And do not ever cut off your kindness from my family, not even when the Lord has cut off every one of David's enemies from the face of the earth. Jonathan has David promise that David will show kindness like the Lord's kindness to Jonathan's family. Well, eventually, King Saul and Prince Jonathan, they die in battle. And when this happens, instead of being happy that he doesn't have to run from King Saul anymore and maybe now he can take the throne and finally be king, David is devastated. David, the writer of much of the book of Psalms in our Bible, writes this song of sadness over the death of Saul and Jonathan. Now it takes a little while even after Saul's death, but eventually David does become king just like God told him he would. There's a little bit of a rebellion by another one of Saul's sons who tries to take over for a few years, but eventually David sits on the throne as the king of Israel. Now during those days um, and in many kingdoms afterwards throughout the whole world, when one dynasty ends and is replaced by another, everyone in the previous king's family would usually be killed by the new king. Now, this might sound harsh, but the reason for this was that the new king was trying to show his power and was preventing anyone from the old royal line from trying to stage a coup or a takeover of the new royal line. Those in Saul's family, they most definitely knew this. Uh, So once David finally sat on the throne, a small war breaks out between Saul's family and David's family. There are fights and murders and one side going over to the other. And it's during this time of unrest and chaos that something happens. And it's here that my favorite story begins. 2 Samuel 4, 4. Jonathan, son of Saul, had a son who was lame in both feet. He was five years old when the news about Saul and Jonathan came from Jezreel. His nurse picked him up and fled. But as she hurried to leave, he fell and became disabled. His name was Mephibosheth. 
in the midst of a transfer of power, which doesn't usually go peacefully in the switching of dynasties, we see this kind of a side note in scripture that reveals that Jonathan, David's very best friend, has left behind a son. When Saul and Jonathan's family find out that Saul and Jonathan have died, there's this mad rush to escape so as to save their own lives. And in this chaotic rushing out of town, Jonathan's son, a five-year-old little boy named Mephibosheth, falls or is dropped by his nurse maybe, crippling him for the rest of his life. So from this time as a small boy on Mephibosheth, he seems to be destined for a pretty rough existence. Where once he would have grown up as a prince in the household of a king, he's now crippled and probably trying to live a life of obscurity so as not to be noticed by the new king for fear that he might lose his very life. He wouldn't have standing, he probably wouldn't have much means, and he had to be cared for by others because of his crippled status. For years, Mephibosheth lives this way. For years, he lives the way he wasn't born or created to live. And maybe you found yourself in a similar situation. No, probably not dropped and crippled from a fall while escaping death from a new dynasty, but maybe you found yourself in a place or a life that you didn't expect to be in. Your trajectory was going one way, but now everything has changed. Now you're living a life you weren't created for. But then something happens. Second Samuel uh, in verse, or chapter 9, starting in verse 1, David asks, Is there anyone still left in the house of Saul to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? So David's been king for a while now. He's experienced great success as the king, winning many victories, accumulating wealth and favor and peace. He's the king that Israel has always hoped to have. And it seems that David, sitting on his throne, enjoying the blessings he's received as king, begins to think of his old friend Jonathan. It seems that he remembers a special promise, a covenant, that he made with his old best friend way before he sat on the throne. Remember back to 1 Samuel chapter 20. But show me unfailing kindness like the Lord's kindness as long as I live, so that I may not be killed and do not ever cut off your kindness from my family, not even when the Lord has cut off every one of David's enemies from the face of the earth. So David sits up and asks the question, who can I show kindness to for Jonathan's sake? So the word kindness here is interesting in this passage. David uses it three times just in this short chapter, but it's used all throughout the Old Testament. It's the Hebrew word hesed, which is often translated loving kindness or mercy or love when used about God in the Psalms. The English translation of kindness fits the word to an extent, but the actual Hebrew word carries a much deeper meaning. It carries with it not just a feeling towards someone else, but the word is rooted in action. It also seems to be connected to the idea of a covenant relationship, a commitment to another that is enduring and unbreakable and loyal, a covenant like David had with Jonathan, a covenant like God has with his people. 2 Samuel 9, 2 and following. Now there was a servant of Saul's household named Ziba. They summoned him to appear before David and the king said to him, Are you Ziba? At your service, he replied. The king asked, Is there no one still alive from the house of Saul to whom I can show God's kindness? Ziba answered the king, There's still a son of Jonathan. He's lame in both feet. Where is he? The king asked. Ziba answered, He's at the house of Machir, son of Amiel and Lodabar. So King David had him brought from Lodabar, from the house of Machir, son of Amiel. So imagine that you're Mephibosheth for a minute. He has successfully hidden himself from the new king for a long time. He's an adult now. Maybe he has this feeling of being safe now that he's been hidden for quite some time. But now he's summoned by the king of Israel. King David, who was treated rather unfairly by his grandfather Saul. King David, who has every right to get rid of all of Saul's household. King David wants to see Mephibosheth. How would you feel? Mephibosheth is scared. 2 Samuel 9, 6a. When Mephibosheth, son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, come, uh, came to David, he bowed down to pay him honor. Mephibosheth bows, hoping to show the king he's no threat. I mean, what else can he do? But then kindness changes his story. 2 Samuel 9, David said, Mephibosheth, 
at your service, he replied. Don't be afraid, David said to him, for I will surely show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. I will restore to you all the land that belonged to your grandfather, Saul, and you will always eat at my table. Mephibosheth bowed down and said, what is your servant that you should notice a dead dog like me? Then the king summoned Ziba, Saul's steward, and said to him, I have given your master's grandson everything that belonged to Saul and his family. You and your sons and your servants are to farm the land for him and bring in the crops so that your master's grandson may be provided for. And Mephibosheth, grandson of your master, will always eat at my table. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. Then Ziba said to the king, your servant will do whatever the Lord my king commands his servant to do. So Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of the king's sons. So Mephibosheth goes from being afraid for his life, you hear how he calls himself a dead dog, to finding himself gaining land, wealth, and status, all in the blink of an eye. He's now taken from his obscurity, given land that belonged to his grandfather Saul, and invited to eat at the table of the king all of his days. Imagine crippled Mephibosheth sitting next to the beautiful daughters and sons, the princes and princesses, of King David. Talk about feeling out of place. Mephibosheth had done nothing to deserve this favor, and yet David's kindness to Mephibosheth completely changed his story. Because kindness, as we can see here, can change someone's story. Now, there are a few things that I want us to take away from this story regarding kindness this week. And I'm not talking about the kindness that we often think about when we're simply just, you know, nice to another person. If we want to show kindness like God shows kindness, this loving kindness, it looks a certain way. First of all, kindness costs. Kindness costs. It certainly costs David. He gave back to the family of his enemy Saul land that he could have kept for himself. It cost him that land. Similarly, kindness might cost us as well. A few years ago, uh, there was a little girl in the children's ministry where I was serving who had a friend get into a really bad car accident, and she suffered some pretty major injuries. The injuries kept this friend out of school for a significant period of time. So this little girl in our ministry, she had a birthday party coming up, and she decided that as a surprise for her friend, she was going to invite her friends to the party and have them bring gifts for this friend who had been in the accident instead of for herself. So this eight-year-old little girl, all on her own, gave up all her own birthday presents to bring joy, to show kindness to her friend who'd been so badly hurt. It cost her. It cost her all of her birthday presents. Of course, with the cost, there's often joy. David got joy knowing he'd kept a promise to his friend, and this little girl loved the surprise that she was able to share with her friend. But their acts of kindness still cost them. What might it cost us today? Time, money, comfortability. Um, I'm a pretty extreme introvert, and so it's sometimes really hard for me to make time for other people because I'd rather kind of hole up by myself at home. Uh, Daniel sometimes tells me that he needs to remind me to be a good friend, uh, to go out with my friends sometimes, to think about them instead of myself. Showing kindness to my friends, to my husband, to even my kids at times means paying the cost of my own comfort showing up for them and doing things with them and for them, even when my comfort tells me to find my own space. Find a way to show kindness this week that costs you something. So first, kindness costs, but secondly, kindness is extravagant. Kindness is extravagant. David could have quite easily shown Mephibosheth the simple kindness of sparing his life, allowing him to live without being noticed by the new king. But that isn't what David did at all. David invited him into his presence. He gave him back the land that his family once owned. He gave him servants to care for him. He gave him the opportunity to eat at the king's table. It was extravagant kindness. Has anyone ever showed you this type of kindness in your life? Uh, If you know me at all, you know that I hate stormy weather. Uh, Storms, they just kind of terrify me. Uh, We lived in Tulsa, Oklahoma for 10 years, and I still never really got used to the crazy weather that they had in what was called Tornado Alley. My parents, they obviously know this about me, and so a few years ago, there had been a pretty active and aggressive storm season, and I had called them multiple times, you know, talking about how scared I was, um, how how scary the tornado sirens are. And to my surprise, a few months later, Daniel and I received the extravagant kindness 
of a storm shelter gifted to us by my family and friends back in Oregon. It was something that we couldn't afford at the time. And so these people who have long loved me collected money to buy one for us. Extravagant kindness. And it might not be in the form of a big or expensive gift either. I have friends that plan yes days for their kids. So on these special days, they seek to say yes to as many things that, as they can for their kids that they might usually say no to. Can we go to McDonald's? Yes. Can I stay up late? Yes. Can we watch this movie? Yes. This could result in extravagant kindness to your kids. Maybe it's carving out an evening or a whole day during a busy season to spend time with a spouse or a friend. This could be an example of extravagant kindness. And during these days when people might be forced to stay home a little more than normal due to virus concerns, we might have to be a little more creative. As school starts up, could you offer to help watch someone's child or help with their virtual school during this weird scheduling so parents can work? Can you offer a night of babysitting to parents who've been with their kids for several months due to the pandemic? To whom can you show extravagant kindness this week? So kindness costs, kindness is extravagant. And finally, kindness gives without the expectation of a return. Kindness gives without the expectation of a return. Mephibosheth was in no way in a position that he could repay the king. He had no power, or position, or money, or influence. And yet, David showed great kindness without expecting to get anything back. Uh, I grew up with a friend who, she lives in California now with her husband, and a few years ago she met a homeless woman uh, that she kind of struck up a relationship with just in places that she would normally go. Um, this woman had some significant issues going on in her life and was in major need in a lot of areas. And over the course of time, my friend actually invited this woman to come and live in their home with them. She lived with them for quite a while, and my friend, she just, she had no strings attached. What might that look like? in your family. So obviously I'm not advocating that you all go out and invite some random person to come live with you, but what act of kindness could your family show with, without the expectation of anything in return? Paying the restaurant bill of a neighboring table anonymously? Leaving a larger than normal tip no, no matter what kind of service you've been given? Paying for the groceries of the family behind you in line at Walmart? doing someone else's chores, or taking on an extra job around the house without being asked. Now, I love this story of David and Mephibosheth, partly because it's a great story about a great king's kindness. And we could stop there and take this lesson home about being kind to others, and it would be a really good lesson for all of us to learn. But the reason I love this story is the picture that it creates and the person it points to. With kids and kids' church, I, I like to talk about how the Bible is full of lots of different stories teaching us lots of different things, yes. But it's also one big story pointing us to one thing, the person of Jesus. You see, we can all identify with Mephibosheth. We were all at one time people lost and broken, living not as we were created or born to live, but because of Jesus and what he did on the cross for each and every one of us in our brokenness, we are invited to the king's table. We are seated where we don't belong, where we are out of place. We are given costly, extravagant kindness that expects nothing in return from a king far greater than we could ever imagine simply because he loves us. God's kindness can and does change our stories. Titus 3, 3 through 7 says, At one time we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us. Not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. How has God displayed this kindness to you? How has it changed your story? Well, I don't have this dramatic tale about my journey to Jesus. I, I came to know him and follow him together with my whole family when I was 10 years old alongside my parents and my brother. And I can remember watching the kindness of God change my parents' story as their lives transformed into a life of serving God, 
following him, living by faith in their finances, changing their daily habits. The kindness of God drew them to him and to looking more like him. And seeing their story change changed my story too. I found myself in church every week, serving alongside my parents, cleaning that church, developing a love for ministry in its varying capacities, going to Bible college, and eventually here, getting to do what I love and what God has gifted me to do. The kindness of God changed my story. In a moment, we're gonna take communion together. So right now you can gather what you'll use for communion, whether that's a cracker or a piece of toast or juice or water. And this morning, as you partake in communion, reflect on God's kindness that cost him so much, that was extravagantly poured out on us and that we could never come close to repaying. And let's let the virtue of this kindness in us change the world around us because kindness can change someone's story. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the story of David and Mephibosheth and how it points to the kindness that you give us um, in Jesus's gift on the cross. I pray that we would uh, hold closely the kindness you've given to us and that we would show that kindness to others. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
I just want to sit here at your feet I'm caught up in this holy moment I never want to leave Oh, yeah, I'm not here for blessings You don't owe me anything It's more than anything that you can do I just want you Oh, I just want you And nothing else Nothing else, and nothing else will do. I just want you, and nothing else, no, nothing else, yeah, nothing else will do. Oh, I just want you, and nothing else. Nothing else, no, nothing else will do. Oh, I just want you, and nothing else. Oh, nothing else, oh, nothing else will do. Oh, I just want you, and nothing else. Oh, and nothing else, no, nothing else will do. Oh, I just want you, and nothing else, yeah, and nothing else. Oh, nothing else will do. Oh, I'm caught up in your presence. I just want to sit here at your feet I'm caught up in this whole, this holy moment I never want to leave Oh, yeah, I'm not here for blessings Jesus, you don't owe me anything It's more than anything that you can do I just want you Yeah, I just want you And nothing else Nothing else, nothing else will do. I just want you. Nothing else, nothing else, nothing else will do. Hey church, we hope that you enjoyed today's service. We want to remind you that if you are able to give, you can do so at leclaircc.com. Also, if you have prayer requests, please send them in so that we can pray with you and for you. And last but not least, we'd like to remind you to join us next week as we are continuing our series called Staff Picks. We'll see you then.